I'm Anna Gjma Busse, I'm director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a lecture in our series on the European financial crisis, made possible by the generosity of one of the friends of the center, Mike Kojayan. Today, it's my privilege to introduce to you Philippe Aguillon, the Robert Wagner Professor of Economics at Harvard University. He, in a brilliant career that has spanned MIT, Oxford, UCL, and now Harvard, has investigated the various facets of economic growth, competition, volatility, and the state. In numerous articles and books, he has examined contract theory and design, capital markets and finance, unemployment <coughs> and the theory of the firm, as well as a topic very dear to our hearts here, which is governance and the performance of universities. His work has been described as profound, innovative, and elegant. And that last adjective is perhaps the indirect influence of his mother, who founded the famous French fashion house, Chloe. She's the one who should have you. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're extremely stylish. Not surprisingly, he's been recognized with the Von Neumann Award, membership in the American Academy of Arts <coughs> and Sciences, an honorary doctorate from the Stockholm School of Economics, and the Schumpeter Prize. He's one of the most prolific and influential econ economists of his generation. And so it is with great pleasure that we welcome Professor Philippe Aquillon to deliver a lecture entitled Growth and the Smart State. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, um, um, so this, uh, uh, these thoughts about the smart state have been uh, kind of resulting from uh, 25 years uh, that I worked on, on growth economics. Maybe, maybe. Uh, um, so 25 years ago, I was, uh, in fact, uh, oh. I met uh, Jim uh, on the job market uh, exactly 25 years ago, 26 almost. And, uh, and so my, during my first year as assistant professor, I met uh, my, my neighbor was uh, Peter Howitt. He was visiting from uh, Ohio State, uh, from, uh, uh, no, no, he was visiting from uh, uh, Western Ontario. And, uh, and I always wanted to, uh, to put Schumpeter into mainstream economics. So that, that's how it started. And, and, um, so when I wrote my statement to, uh, as a Harvard, you know, to go to apply to Harvard University as a student, because in 80, I applied in 83, to, I started in 84 as a student, uh, I, I said I wanted to put in perfect competition in growth economics. And uh, so what I did was when I arrived in Harvard, I, I, uh, I, I studied I.O. with uh, Dick Caves, who was uh, Jim's advice, main advisor, and, uh, and Caves was talking about Schumpeter, and I thought this guy was really interesting. But you know, the growth we were studying well, was the very elegant model of Bob Solo, which gives you exactly the kind of model of a model. Quoi. And, and, uh, but, but there was not, none of the interesting stuff that Schumpeter was talking about. And, and so then my, my, my obsession was to say, I want to be able to, to model Schumpeter. So of course, I realized that I had to learn about IO a bit. And so that's why uh, it was very helpful to have caves. I also worked a lot with Jean Tirole and was very much influenced by his book, The Theory of uh, IO. And, and then uh, when I arrived as this uh, professor, Peter Howitt was a macroeconomist. He had worked essentially on search theory and monetary economics. And I said, look, Peter, why don't we try to do it? Well, let's model Schumpeter. You know, I have the IO. You, you are more the macro guy. Let's get together and, uh, and, 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 and have a model. And have a model you know, that, uh, uh, that, um, that encompasses the idea that growth is driven by innovations that uh, innovations result from uh, profit-motivated activities, and that it involves creative destruction, because uh, we think it's a very important aspect of growth, that the new replaces the old, and that growth involves a conflict between the old and the new. And, and we know that there is a lot in the political economy of growth associated with this conflict between the old and the new. And that's how we, we uh, so I could have given another lecture, which I could put on the web, but I, I'm doing some uh, publicity, uh, which is called, uh, what do we learn from Schumpeter and growth theory? And I believe that Schumpeter and growth theory says a lot of things that none of the other models talks about. I mean, AK, uh, product variety, and all that, I mean, they are fine, I mean, but, but I think Schumpeter and economics does, you know, can talk about, uh, put firms at the, at the heart of the growth process. You see, put micro at the heart of the growth process. And so, in fact, you see what I've done? So what we did with Howitt is to, is to have a basic, yeah, as I go, I will do some, uh, I, I will not end up naked, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, uh, and so we started, you know, to, to build this model, this Schumpeter model, and then, we, and then we realized that he had some prediction and some counterfactuals. So then what we've been doing is to, is to improve, and, and, to, so to improve and, and extend the model so that we could talk about competition, understand comp the, you know, the link between competition and patenting better, and, and, uh, and more generally, firms, how firms uh, 
uh, you know, uh, how re IO plays out in the growth process. And, and, uh, and the kind of next step in the research has been the fact that uh, at University College London, I could, uh, 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 I could interact with Richard Blondell. And Richard Blondell, they have uh, uh, something called the Institute of Fiscal Studies. And this Institute of Fiscal Studies, they do microeconometrics. And they, they deal with con con consumption data, but also firm level data. And so that was exactly what we needed. We, need, that's, we, we wanted to have the econometrics associated with the kind of models we were doing. We could not do ju just cross-country regression, although I may, we may still do. But it was more like saying, you know, you want to understand how competition affects, you know, innovation and productivity growth in different types of firms. You need to go at firm level. And that has been the next big step, which was uh, a series of papers. One of them is called Competition and Innovation and Inverted U Relationship, which is a paper with Blondell that came, up in, uh, came out in uh, 2005 in the QGE. But that was really a second phase of the, of the research, is to say, no, you have a, a paradigm, and the paradigm is something you can put to the data and to micro data, uh, uh, and it's also something that allows you to talk about growth policy making. And, that's, and so that, that's what we've been do, doing over the past uh, 25 years. That's been, that's been the, the general enterprises. And now, I mean, my, my thinking is a bit, so at the beginning is a bit to think what, what kind of economic structure you need. You know, all the debate on liberalization, on uh, labor market and product market uh, flexibility, and the role that they play or not in the growth process. And, and the next step is the role of the state. You said you, and in fact, uh, with the crisis, you had the same debate in the US. You, you were talking, you know, should you have minimal state? Should you have uh, something different? Should you have Keynesian state? And, and now the, there is the, this whole issue. What, how, what does it mean, the state in the growth process? And, uh, and what does it mean to restructure the state, uh, you know, to adapt to a different kind of growth process? And that's the kind of, that's what a bit I want to talk about uh, to now, today. Uh, now, by the way, uh, uh, since we are, not, uh, we, uh, how would you like, how, how long do we have? Uh, we have until 5.30, so if you Okay, so I can go on for a while, but then you know, it might be fun if you, uh, how do you do it usually? Is it a kind of uh, magistral uh, lecture? <laughs> or, or, we or, we, or, or we interact with the, how do you do it? How do you want to, to have it? We don't believe in Socrates. So if you could go until five or so, and then and then and then, we, and then we call question, it would be fun, no? I mean, because I think the idea is to is to engage a conversation. Okay, that's that's great. That, that's okay. The perfect format. I will open. <laughs> What did you say? What did you, sorry? It's not econ rules. We, we tend to listen to you and then we'll ask questions. Ah, okay, okay. You don't start, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, excellent. So uh, you, you see, I'm still slide. <laughs> I'm st I've still not moved my slide. Yeah, so it's a uh, new growth theory emphasizes entrepreneurial innovation as managing of growth. These theories predict that growth is enhanced by good investment climate because you look at growth from the point of view of firms, you look at how policies and institutions influence the growth process because they affect the incentives and, uh, and also the constraints faced by firms that, that, that innovate. And of course, uh, uh, the, a kind of first way was to say, well, you produce something like a Washington consensus. No, I mean, you say, well, you know, obviously, if you don't have a property right protection, uh, nobody wants to innovate because, you know, you will not uh, reap the benefits from, from your innovation. If you have hyperinflation, like in Germany in the 30s or Argentina in the 80s, uh, it's another form of expropriation, and you want there, will not, you, there won't be much long-term investment, long-term innovative investment. Uh, uh, there is all the debate on flexible product and labor markets, uh, uh, which actually is very interesting because earlier on the Reynolds growth model, don't predict that competition is good for growth. That's really something that the Schumpeterian model predicts. It's, uh, the non schumpeterian model do never predict that you know, uh, uh, competition is a good thing for growth. Uh, uh, but anyway, out of this came some, what we called, what we used to call the Washington Consensus. So the Washington Consensus was this idea that emerged in the, in the late 80s, particularly you know, with the transition uh, in Eastern Europe, which was to say, well, you, know, you should stabilize uh, um, so the, the, the economy, you should liberalize, and you should privatize. And that was a bit the idea, and the view was to say, well, if you go more or less everywhere, and you tell them those three things to do, you can't be very wrong. And, and, and that's what growth is about. So there is not much point going further in, in policy advising, OK? Uh, uh, but, but the thing is that this model has shown its limits, in a sense, because uh, uh, 
we, we've seen, you know, in, in, in economies that have done all the things that the Washington Consensus asks, you still have, you know, high long-term unemployment rates, for example, in Europe, leading to high rates of human capital depreciation. Uh, uh, you, we see in various European countries the de deindustrialization process and excessive outsourcing, uh, but not in, less so in Germany than in France or in other countries. So that's something that we are intrigued by. Is that is that is it? Should we have all the German way or, or, the, or other countries that are, seem to outsource everything that are not uh, upstream and downstream services? So that's the kind of question that, uh, that the Washington Consensus does not allow you to, to answer. And, uh, uh, and of course, there is the whole issue that was raised, that was <coughs> raised again by the crisis, is that you know, how can you maintain innovative investment over the business cycle? You see what, what, what kind of policy? Is there a role for the state there? Should you just uh, let uh, the economy uh, just have a laissez-faire approach and that solves it? And there is something, uh, uh, also something else that came up. And I, when I say increase inequality, in fact, that's not the right bullet point I should have put. I should have put sustainable growth. There is the, the notion now that you want growth, but you want growth to be sustainable. And the sustainability of growth is, uh, has several dimensions to it. I, I, let me just point two dimensions. One is the climate, of course, but one is the inequality. It's the fact that you know, we know that growth can generate inequality. We know that it did uh, uh, since the late uh, 70s, uh, early 80s. And, and the question is, is, is that fine? Or is there a problem letting uh, inequality become too big? And on the other hand, you don't want to eliminate the inequality, you know, you want incentives, but is there a problem if you have too, many, too much inequality in a, in a country? Uh, okay, do you have a problem of sustainability? So now people start talking about sustainable growth, including the climate aspect, and what they call the inclusive growth aspect. So even now, you can see IMF now is, uh, I'm supposed to go there, to help them shape a, 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 a course called inclusive growth, IMF. Quoi. You imagine IMF 20 years ago talking about inclusive growth. So, uh, um, so that's, that's interesting. So I, I would have put the full, this bullet point more like sustainable growth. So those are things that the Washington Consensus doesn't deal with, okay? And, and we'll... Uh, we'll uh. So, uh, um, so now there, there are, in, if you want to approach uh, growth policy, uh, yeah, there are several layers. I mean, I, I, you know, the kind of model I've been working on tells you that innovation is at the heart of the growth process. So of course you want R&D is a good thing. And more generally subsidizing innovation is a good thing. So there was first a view, uh, particularly in Europe, that you would just do, you know, increase R&D subsidies and that would do the trick in a sense. You see what I mean? That was like magic powder. You know, you put R&D subsidies a bit everywhere and then, you know, flowers bloom and everything goes fine. And they realized that it didn't work. There was the Lisbon agenda. And there was a kind of failure of what we call the Lisbon agenda. Okay, we said it's true, the US, they spend more than we do in Europe on R&D, and, and that's what we are missing. And then they realized that there was a layer bef be underneath R&D, which was product market. They regulate, you know, you need to reform product markets. I will get back to that. That we, it was not enough to have R&D subsidies. If, for example, like in Portugal, right, you, in many countries, France also, but we'll go to southern you know, Europe, where you have huge entry barriers, uh, where you have, uh, you know, you look at the Jankov et al measures or whatever, uh, you have very little entry and exit. You can have as much R&D subsidies as you want. If you're in an economy where you have a very high excessive product and labor market regulation, you won't go very far. So then there was the, the view, and, and people start realizing that you, you had a layer underneath R&D subsidy, which was a knowledge, pure knowledge, which was structural reforms, which you say, well, you have to deal with market liberalization. And now we all say, you know, it's good to have more market product labor market flexibility, okay? That was not obvious, by the way. You, you, there was a lot of study to be done because uh, earlier model did not predict that competition was such an important thing. If you talk to, to uh, Bill Gates, he will not tell you that competition is fantastic. He will not tell you that having strong antitrust legislation is the one. He will tell you the opposite. He will tell you, if you believe in patent policy and R&D policy, you should not believe in antitrust policy because one does exactly what the other one is supposed not to do. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a, something, of course, that Schumpeter and Models tell you that, no, they are complementary, they are not exclusive. But uh, uh, so, so there was all this layer that came about with the structural reforms. And it's true that you had a number of reports. I, I worked on a report called the Sapir report, uh, since we talk about Europe. Uh, I don't know if you heard that name. Uh, I was in the Sapir group, and uh, uh, we did a report for Prodi, 
And the basis of the report was very much the structural reforms. I will get back to the Sapir report and, and the theory underlying the Sapir report was very much something I had been working with Asimo Glu and Zilibotti, and I will say a few words in a moment. So, so there was the idea that you had to deal, that it was, uh, you had also another, which was, I think, KOK, I think, report. I don't know if that's, was it, am, am I right? Those who are uh, European specialists, is that the Koch report? Yeah, was it? Yes? OK. So those two reports are a bit saying Lisbon agenda is not enough. You need to do structural reform. OK? And, uh, uh, and then, but then there is another layer, which, is the, which, which the crisis, uh, uh, you know, pointed out. It's the state. The problem is that we have, it's not only a problem of liberalizing labor market, product market. It's that the state is not functioning properly. We spend too much on, on things that we don't need to spend on. And we don't spend enough maybe on things we need to spend more on. And there is the whole issue of what kind of state do you need? So you see the three things, the kind of there is a basic knowledge R&D layer. Then you have the labor product market flexibility. And then you have a layer underneath, which is the state, rethinking the state. What does it mean to restructure the state, to reform the state? That's, the, that's, that's how, uh, and that's why the, how my own thinking has been, has been you know, evolving, OK? Uh, so, for example, to be more concrete about the state, you, we, uh, uh, you see, I mean, I talk about France, but other European countries had the same model. Uh, 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 you, after World War II, we had what we call the welfare state, okay? In France, we had the Trente Glorieuse. So if you look at the French, you know, of course, most of it exemplified particularly during the De Gaulle period, you had essentially the state was doing three things. I'm sure, I'm sure here I'm, you know, I'm intimidated because Jim knows France much better than I do. Uh, uh, so Jim, please feel free to raise your hands. No, 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 no. Yeah, you know, it's not right. Uh, uh, they had an industrial policy which was based very much on what we could call national champions. So part of them were nationalized firms, but also private firms that were monopolies, like Dassault, for example, for planes, okay? Uh, 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 or, or Peugeot Citroën or whatever. Uh, Peugeot and Citroën, they were separated at the time. So the idea was that, uh, 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 some Marxists would call it capitalist monopolist d'état. <laughs> uh, so there was a kind of view that, you know, uh, uh, you have the state and, and the state can act through these champions. So you, you deal with a few firms, and that's how you, that's how you, you. so then, then there was the, the macroeconomic policy, and it was essentially Keynesian. I mean, whenever you would be in a recession, you would just do a stimulus, you see what I mean? And when you were, uh, when you were to, to the overheating of the economy, you would increase interest rate to, you know, to make it go down, okay? The, the Brits had to stop and go in France, but it was a, you could call that basically a Keynesian regulation of the cycle, by the demand, through the demand side. And then you had the welfare state, but the problem there, the unemployment was very low at the time. You had no problem on unemployment because there was very little creative destruction. You see what I mean? You, essentially, many people would spend their whole life in, in the same firm, you see? And, and uh, the problem was the, to deal with what we call les petits salaires. We had small wages in France, and you would try to complete les petits salaires by having some kind of, you know, uh, 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 some kind of, of allowances. You see what I mean? That you would say, you know, allocation familiale, family allowances to encourage uh, people having more children or whatever. And, you, and that was essentially, if you can go on TV, if you really understand French, you can listen to Pompidou, at INA, whatever, and he would say, I had the politique des de petits salaires, like the politique de, you know, the social policy. But there was not to deal with unemployment. That was not an issue. So that was the state, that, that was the welfare state, essentially. It's extremely top-down, top-down industrial policy, uh, Keynesian regulation, and, uh, and this essentially welfare state you did with social issues. But uh, uh, now this model no longer works because now, uh, we came from, uh, we were essentially the Trente Glorieuse, and that's a theme that uh, we, uh, growth in countries like France was relying on imitation. We were an imitating economy at the time. We were catching up. So when you are catching up, it's no big deal not to have enormous amount of competition. It's no big deal to have limited amount of flexibility on the labor and product market. Uh, 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 you can have the same firms imitating and imitating. You see what I mean? When you, when, when you exhaust imitation because you've become your, yourself more advanced and you need frontier innovation to grow because now, nowadays it's the emerging markets that imitate. So the, the, the Europeans have to, to do something else. They have to innovate more. Uh, then creative destruction much, becomes much more important. And when you have creative destruction, 
you know, industrial policy based on national champions. But when you have firms that come and go, what does it mean industrial policy? See, how you do it? You can't do it the same way when you have creative destruction and when you don't. Okay? Uh, uh, now the economies have become much more open. So you cannot just say now, you know, my economy is in recession, I will just increase spending. Because in fact, people uh, spend on foreign goods. That's why, you know, the French government in 81 tried to do that, and people uh, were buying German goods, essentially. You see what I mean? And uh, then they had to reverse the policy in 83. Okay? And, uh, and, the, and the welfare state, the role of the state now, you have a new uh, uh, issue that the state has to deal with, which is, the, uh, you know, what you do with workers where they are displaced from jobs to jobs, because now you have creation and destruction of jobs. And the issue is, what do you do? Is there a role for the state there or not? You see what I mean? Is, uh, and, uh, and there are various answers to that, to that question. Okay? So, so, but at least it's clear, that the, it's clear that the old welfare state model is no longer valid. Now, what do you replace it by? Well, some people would tell you minimal state, Tea Party or whatever, I don't want to enter into, uh, maybe you raise your hand and say, no, no, I don't understand the thing. <laughs> but some people say, minimal state, what you just do is because you have a much more creative destruction and all that, the state should just withdraw. The state should just maintain law and order. And that's it, quoi. And, and uh, you should minimize taxes. You should minimize uh, uh, government spending so that uh, you, you, put, uh, you don't put pressure on interest rates, so that firms face the best possible environment, they hire, and you get out of the crisis very quickly. So that's the view, that's the neoconservative. They just say, you know, you, now that you have this uh, creative destruction and that everything is there, that the state should just withdraw from most, except law and order, except the reg what we call in French, les fonctions régaliennes. Voilà. But <coughs> now, there is another answer to this, which is what I, why I took, it's a smart state. And, and I will try to explain to you what, why I believe that the minimal state is not the solution. That, you, that this one is no longer, but you have a, a third way. And, and the third way is what I call the smart state. Okay? And then we can look at what it implies for Europe. I don't know if I will ever get there, but... Uh, okay. So, uh, 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 I, w I want to point to, uh, 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 I will talk mainly about the first, the first two, and I will say just a few words about the third one. Uh, uh, to the three main growth enhancing function of a smart state. There is the role of, as an investor, there is the role as an insurer, and there is a role as a, as a redistributor, okay? You could think that redistributor and insurer is part of the same, and you might think that in fact my three are two, which is fine, I mean, if you, you may see it this way. But, uh, 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 so that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, so that's what I want to, to talk about the, those roles. So, so the first, I, I usually talk about the paradigm for analyzing growth policy, but that I talked about this, the Schumpeterian paradigm, innovation driven by entrepreneurial investment, which are themselves motivated by prospects of monopoly rents. Uh, the second idea that I mentioned is that frontier innovation and limitation require different sets of policies and institutions. And of course, when you are very far from the technological frontier, it's imitation your main source of growth. And therefore, you have certain kind of policies that are adapted to imitation. But when you are already close to the technological frontier, you need to rely on frontier innovation. And frontier innovation is a lot about creation and destruction of firms. And you need to have an environment that's conducive to uh, uh, creation and destruction of firms. So, <coughs> uh, uh, and that was really the idea that I developed, that idea I developed with Asemoglu and Zili Botti. Uh, in a paper that came out in the Journal of the European Economic Association, and that's, a, that's the paper, uh, as, a, as a book which John Robinson called Why Nation Fail, but very much at the heart of that book is these uh, three lines, okay? And, and, uh, uh, and, and very much at the heart of the Sapir report was that, that thing. In fact, what we did in the Sapir report was just to say, Europe has to change institutions and policies because now we are frontier economy. So it was really this idea that we declined in the, that we, that we developed in the Sapir report. Okay, so, so for example, so that would say here, post-war period growth in European countries are driven by imitation over time, particularly with globalization. Innovation has become the driving force of growth. Innovation requires flexibility and turnover, and therefore different policies and institutions. So for example, just to tell you, because I could say now you are just preaching and you don't show us anything, so let me just show you some pictures. So one example is competition and growth. What you can show is that competition and entry is more growth enhancing for countries and sectors that are closer to the technological frontier. And, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and you can see, so for example here, that's based on work I did with Blondell uh, and Suzanne Prentel and other co colleagues, Rachel Griffiths, uh, all my English, my uh, UK friends. 
So uh, this, this is on UK firm. So on the horizontal axis, I have foreign entry rate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a major competition. Okay, you liberalize entry more or less. And, uh, uh, and on the vertical axis, you have total factor productivity growth. I could have put uh, innovation rate. I could have put patenting. We have the same, the same picture. The red line is the average for firms that are less than median close to their frontier. You know, you have firms that are very close to the best practice in their frontier, you know, worldwide. And there are firms that are very far from the best practice. So those who are less than median uh, close, uh, the laggards, I call them, are the red firms. Those who are the more than median are the blue firm. And what's very striking is that when you liberalize, the, the response of the red and the blue are opposite. The, 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 the blue tend to be stimulated by competition because, in fact, they are already very good. You, you, you make entry threat bigger, they say, God, I have to work harder, but then I can beat the, the foreign entrant because I know the local market. If I work harder, I can, I can you know, beat the other. The red one, they are discouraged. They say, oh, God, let's give up. You see what I mean? And, and so, so what's interesting, alors overall, in developed countries, you have more blue firms than red firms. When you are a less developed country, you have more red firms than blue firms. And that tells you why competition overall is more growth enhancing when you are close to the frontier than when you are far from the frontier. Alors it also tells you something interesting vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Washington consensus. The Washington consensus would just tell you liberalize. But you see, they would not take into account the fact that you have an unequalizing effect of liberalization. And therefore, you need to have complementary policies, in particular to retrain workers that are in the red firms to be able to reallocate to the blue firms. And that's where the smart state comes in already. So already with this picture, you can see the role for the smart state. You can see why the minimal state approach is not sufficient. OK? Alors, where am I now? OK, <coughs> that's the first example. Now let me give you another example, it's education. When you are in the business of uh, uh, imitation, uh, uh, then, you know, in that case, uh, primary, secondary education, maybe specialized undergrad, it's enough. And in France, well, that's what we had. We had very good primary, secondary. Now it's declining, by the way. Uh, uh, and we had the grandes écoles. You know, we had the polytechnique, normal sup, whatever, uh, engineering schools. And that was pretty fine, you know, as long as we were in the business of imitation. But when you become an innovating economy, you don't do, you don't build a Silicon Valley just, you know, with uh, undergraduate schools. I mean, that's no way. I mean, if they didn't have Stanford, they would not have had the Silicon Valley. So you need to push graduate education. And then I, I've done studies, both across country and, and cross state US. And uh, that, that's based on a study with Oxby and, and other co authors which I think will never be published because, I don't know, Caroline is too meticulous and she thinks that we'll never get there to the publication, to, to even signing it. But uh, uh, we have a version of it in economic policy. But what, what's interesting is that you, you can look at states that are close to frontier. So, for example, the, the, it used to be that Michigan was the frontier state. I don't know until when. Uh, nowadays, it's California, okay? But you are not far from the frontier. But, uh, uh, and then you have the far from frontier states, which, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, etc. So when, when you, and, and what's very interesting is that in a frontier state, research education is very much growth enhancing. When you are in a far from frontier state, it's better to, to invest in two year, uh, for your colleges, to your college and below. So it's very interesting. So now if I do it within US, the, the, it will be the, between the up to two years and then after two years. You see what I mean? If I do that uh, across country, it would be maybe primary, secondary versus tertiary. You see what I mean? But that's very clear that, you know, when the closer, the more frontier you are, the more pro, you know, you, the more it's on, uh, your growth relies on innovation, the more you have to rely on research education. You see, so that's, that's why now in France and in, other con in Germany, they realize they have to improve their universities. They realize that, you know, Germany, they had the excellence initiative. And in France, uh, with Sarkozy, we started uh, the thing. We, well, now uh, I try to continue this, to push, uh, uh, to, to, to keep the, the, the reform of universities in France. But you see, countries are facing this dilemma of having to change their university system because they have to, uh, to become a fully innovative economy. And that's, that's another instance, you see, where. Uh, so those are kind of ideas so which go beyond the, the Washington consensus, that you cannot propose the same policies everywhere. You see what I mean? <clears throat> For example, Brazil. Brazil was a place where you had better graduate schools than in France, you know, in economics. 
But the reason was because you had very high inequality. So in Brazil, what would happen is that the rich people would send their children to private schools, primary, secondary. And then, of course, they would vote for governments that propose to put all the money in tertiary because they knew that the poor would never get there anyway. So it was just for them, you see what I mean? So even though Brazil was far below frontier, they were spending way too much on tertiary compared to primary, secondary. But that's because of the political economy. Okay? They should have spent more. And that's what Lula and others try to do, is to rebalance towards primary, secondary. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of idea. So now, we, we, that's the kind of basic theory, okay? And now we go back to the state. And I say, why do you want the state as a strategic investor? You want the state as a strategic investor, contrary to what neoconservatives would believe, because you have two kinds of things that neoconservatives never take into account. One of them is called technologic knowledge externalities. For example, if I decide to go and educate myself, it's good for me but I have uh, externalities on other people who are in the same class. I have externalities on my children, and I have growth externalities. Those are not taken into account by uh, neoconservatives. They, they don't, they, the notion of knowledge externality is foreign to them. They don't know what it is. And the second thing is uh, uh, credit constraints, is that even though I would like to invest, I might not be able to invest because I face credit constraints. And so the combination of the credit constraints and the knowledge externalities make the case for state for state intervention. Now the question is, how do you do state intervention? Okay, so uh, uh, so that's what I'm saying here: knowledge externalities, education, health, or whatever, and credit constraints, budget constraints make it impossible. Alors now the, the problem is, is that fine? The state should intervene, but now th can the state intervene everywhere? And uh, and the question is, it cannot. And and the problems that European co countries have these days, but the U.S. has also, is that we are facing the problem that we have. But, uh, deficits that we have to reduce, public deficits, but still we want to grow. So how do you manage that? And you manage that through a combination of smart taxation. We will talk about what kind of a good tax system could be, and we could have a discussion on that. I will get back to the tax system. But also, it's through the policy of smart spending. That's what I call it, the smart state. What do I call smart spending? It means that there are, I think, two elements that are important. First, you have to target your investment. So uh, th that involves both what I call horizontal and vertical targeting. Horizontal targeting is when you say, look, R&D is important. Uh, education is important. Support to universities is important. Support to your know, small business act is important. That is horizontal. You see what I mean? But then you might still, that I think is pretty uncontroversial. Even in the UK, when you have a pretty conservative government, but not as far right as, uh, as Tea Party, the horizontal targeting pro goes down pretty well, okay? What goes, what's the harder one, which I will try to make a case for, which is still very controversial, is the vertical targeting. It's to say, I, I should go everywhere, but look, uh, uh, new in, uh, renewable energy is something important. Uh, biotech is something important, and the state might have to do something. That's a very controversial one, and then we get back to it, okay? But there is a notion that you should target investment, okay? And of course, there is a political economy, how you make sure that the targeting is done efficiently. And that's where democracy plays a role. We will get back to that, okay? And then there is something else, which is the idea that you should link investments to changes in governance. For example, in France, you see, when, uh, or in Germany, when they did the excellent initiative in Germany, they made it conditional upon universities coming up with the governance, governance plans. They should be properly governed. So uh, you link investment to changing governance. Because just putting money is not enough. You, you, you have to have properly organized the system. And I will get back to that. It's true for schools and universities. It's true for industrial policy. And it's true for labor markets. Okay? So, so that, I think, is an, another very important idea, which is not in the Keynesian policy. Keynesian policy, the idea is that you can put money everywhere. People spend it, and then the economy goes back. That's very different. Here, you target your investment and uh, to growth enhancing, to potentially growth enhancing, and you link it to changes in governance. You never talk about governance in Keynesian policy. Okay? That's the... So for example, let me just uh, show you first example on why the governance is important. It's education. Here I show, uh, that's taken from uh, work that, Anushek was not at Michigan at some point, Eric Anushek. No, he was not there. So it's Hanushek and Wassman. Wassman is at the University of Munich. They looked at link between PISA and growth. So that's a cross-country regression. And you know, 
you may be insulting what you think about, you know, they are very problematic. Uh, but but what's very interesting is that when you have uh, when you plot uh, 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 when you plot uh, growth on on test scores on PISA test, you see very much a very highly positive correlation. Whereas in, by contrast, when you plot growth on years of schooling, but they could have spent also spending in schooling, you find almost a horizontal. For example, Portugal spends a lot in education, but it's very bad. We spend a lot in France uh, on education, but not that good. Whereas Finland is the model. Finland, they do things right. And we, we can go back, and because they have done the right things. You see what I mean? So, uh, 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 so that shows the importance of governance. You see, governance is important. Uh, I could say the same for universities. It's true that you spend more, you, you, you have better Shanghai index, okay? Uh, uh, but, but also it's important autonomy. So here, for example, is an index of autonomy. We know more autonomous universities tend to do better than less autonomous universities. And in fact, what's interesting, you can show the complementarity between uh, uh, how much you invest in universities and autonomy of universities. But we know even better. We know that it's good to have, uh, that universities have board, that have, have boards with alumni, and that we know we can go much more in detail, showing you know that performance is very much linked to particular features that university can have, and uh, and that's very interesting because then you know you look at growth policy in a much finer way. It's not just spend more there or spend more there. You look at the governance. You see, you look at how you you do things. So I just that's just for you to glance. Uh, uh, now, so that's the uh, or, so you could say that for universities you could look at other things. I would like to take another example where governance matters. And at the same time, to try to sell you the idea that you may want to have vertical targeting. So it's my case for uh, 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 sectoral policy. We, you know very well there was a kind of argument in, in favor of what we call industrial policy, which was based on the infant industry argument. Okay, Stiglitz and Greenwald, but others have formalized it. But you know, various people have formalized this argument. It's to say, well, look, suppose you are a developing country. You have a uh, uh, mainly agricultural sector, but you have a nascent industrial sector that has huge potential knowledge externalities on the rest of the economy. But initially, they have high cost, and they lower their cost through learning by doing. OK, so if you open up right away, of course, you kill the industrial sector. So there is no knowledge externality, because of course, the assumption is that it's the local industrial sector that can have the knowledge externality, not the foreign one. So in that case, you may want to protect the industrial sector for a while. Meanwhile, loc the local costs go down, and therefore they will be able to have the knowledge externality on the rest of the economy. That was the infant industry argument. But based on that, you know, uh, the World Bank and others, you know, proposed in the 50s and, and 60s, you know, uh, industrial policies uh, uh, pretty much everywhere. And uh, but you know, they didn't work very well. So uh, people like Anne Kruger. You know, in the 80s, I said, well, look, this is rubbish. You know, they does, it doesn't work. And she was right. She had good arguments. She said, you know, uh, there is a problem with this thing. It's a third government. How, she, how do they know what, what to do? Why should they know where to invest? How can they pick winners and losers? How do they know how to pick winners and losers? And that's assuming that they are even honest, but they may be incompetent, you see? But uh, by the way, in addition, they may be corrupt. They will give to their friends. Why should they give to? So this is a very bad idea altogether, you see? So just give it up. Just do horizontal, just do other things. Forget about sectoral policy, OK? Now, uh, uh, there are various reasons why we may want to reconsider, you see? Uh, one reason is that if you look at the crisis, you know, first, uh, uh, countries that didn't look at all at sectoral investment did very poorly. For example, Southern Europe, <coughs> you, they let you know, the real estate grow too big. And, and they became very dependent on it. And, and that was terrible, you know, for countries like, uh, you know, Portugal or Ireland or whatever, they, they relied so much on the United States. Well, in UK, relied too much on the financial sector. Maybe had the UK diversified into something else than finance, maybe it would have been easier for them. I don't know. But at least there is the idea that if, uh, the crisis revealed that some countries, maybe, you know, it might have been a good thing to do some vertical targeting. China did pretty well, who does vertical targeting. By the way, Germany does some vertical targeting. They, they don't call it openly this way. It's done a lot at the lender level, by the way. But they do industrial policy. And uh, they call it uh, East Germany or whatever. What they call structural policy. So they have a name, no? Uh, they use another name, but they do some. And, uh, um, and there is a third reason. So, so far, one reason is the crisis. Another reason is China. 
and other countries that do it. And then when they do it, what do you do? Okay. <coughs> the third reason is climate. Uh, 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 and, and I will come to and, and I will get to that. The idea is to say, well, you know, you want to direct production and innovation towards clean uh, energy. You see, and and that's an, that's a sec that's a vertical policy. Okay. So uh, let me de let me go get. Uh, but now the thing is that uh, what might be very interesting. There's been a study by Nunn and Treffler that came up in the American Economic Journal where they showed that sectoral subsidies are more growth enhancing if they target more skill intensive sectors. So they said, you know, you could uh, have a rule. So for example, say you target sectors with high growth potential. That w that seems to work. You see, I mean, you could have criteria. And in in work that I have in progress, which is not yet. Uh, 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 with uh, Anne Harrison and other co-authors, we, we show that sectoral subsidies have a more positive effect on productivity and innovation when they are associated with greater competition. So the idea is that if I target a more competitive sector and that I do it in a way that maintains competition, then, I, and that brings me to another idea. Anne Kruger would oppose competition in industrial policy. I've said, if I believe in competition, I should not do industrial policy. But what prevents you from doing a policy that would favor a sector, not a firm? So you would do it very differently from the De Gaulle time where you would pick one champion. But you could very well imagine, even at the European level, not necessarily at the developed world country, that you target one sector and you help everybody there, maintaining competition among them. And in fact, what you can show is that when you do that, when you have a lower Herfindahl index, for example, a more dispersion, of, of subsidy uh, uh, within a sector, and that you target the competitive sector, it works much better than if you just give it to all to one firm. So, so that's an interesting idea, because now I'm having an interesting discussion with Almunia. Almunia is the Joachim Almunia is the head of the competition uh, 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 commission. He's a competition commissioner uh, uh, in Brussels. Uh, 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 and, 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 and I took one when I said, look, you, you, know, you, you should be the one in charge of the industrial policy. It should be under you. You see what I mean? You would be in charge of it. You would make a pro-competition industrial policy. You make sure that it's pro-competitive. But that's a very interesting thing, by the way. I will show you some slides. Because now, the way it's done competition policy in Europe, it's very much legalistic ex ante. No, uh, you know, you should no dominant position. No state, uh, sectoral state aid. And I say, no, you will have sectoral state aid, but I will ex post, I will check the degree of competition. If I see that the, the, your state aid has been done in a way that reduces competition, then I get at you. But if I see that your, the state aid has been done in a way that does not reduce competition, then I'm OK. You see what I mean? So I try to tell them, look, it's fine to do competition based, but instead of doing it in an ex ante legalistic way, do it in an ex post empirical way. You see what I mean? So it's the whole way to do competition. And you could, in fact, reconcile competition policy and vertical targeting. You could make them, you could make a vertical targeting pro competition. You see what I mean? And, and, uh, and that, I think, is an idea. That's an idea that I've tried to push over the, the past year. So, so it, it, there is just, uh, 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 so that already I went. So what we did with, uh, uh, the, here is an interesting thing. So we had Chinese firms. And uh, what we did was to look at product innovation, but we also look at productivity growth. But here it's product innovation. And uh, here it's, uh, 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 that's uh, as a uh, function of uh, competition in the sector. And that's the interaction between the subsidy and competition. And what we show is that the, the, the interaction, when you look at the sector where, uh, 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 when you look at the sector where you disperse a lot the subsidies, you have a, uh, uh, you, you, you have an effect of the interaction between competition and subsidies. You see what I mean? If I, if I do, if I, uh, 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 if, I, if, I, if I give subsidies to a sector that is already competitive, and I do it in a way that maintains competition because I disperse the, the subsidies, I'm very likely to have good uh, innovation and growth results. If I, give, if I take a non-competitive sector and or a, I give a sector that might be competitive but I give all the, uh, the, the R&D to one firm, that's not good. You see, that's very interesting. That's, uh, again, about governance. It's not just you do it or not do it. It's how you should do it. You see what I mean? So you should not be a priori opposed to any form of vertical targeting. There is just a way to say, no, do it the right way. And I think it's much better because if you tell people don't do it, they find a way to do it. You see, it's like the don't ask, don't tell. You see what I mean? It's exactly the same. They do it. So at least it's better to acknowledge that they do it 
and come up with, with the guidelines so that they do it better. You see? So that, that's what I try to... That's what I try to push. The other case for uh, sectoral policy is the, the, the notion of what I call path dependence in the direction of innovation on the laissez-faire. That means that typically, suppose you are a good dancer and a bad cook. You will try to innovate your dancing, not your cooking. You want to innovate where you are good, not where you are bad. But in fact, it turns out that firms are exactly the same. If you've been innovating in uh, combustion, en com com combustion uh, engine, you know, CO2 uh, producing things in the past, you will keep doing it in the future. There is what we call past dependence in the direction of innovation. And uh, uh, that's not totally obvious a priori, because you could imagine that you run into decreasing returns. You could have imagined instead that if I've done a lot of dirty innovation in the past, I run out of steam on those, and now I want to start the other one. But it turns out that what dominates is the past dependence. So I did a recent paper, which is on my website, with uh, Von Rinen and uh, other co-authors. And uh, what we do is that we explore data from the automotive industry. And, uh, 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 and, and, and that's very interesting because we know uh, we can classify innovations into you know, electric car uh, oriented or non-electric car. We can classify them into dirty and clean innovations. And we know the identity of the innovator. And we know the history of what he's done before. So we know what the guy has been doing before. So we can really t talk about past dependence. And what we show is that the firm or individual's propensity to innovate clean is positively correlated with the stock of past clean innovation and negatively correlated with the stock of past dirty innovation. And when you have a carbon tax or research, of course, you, you push towards innovating clean. You see, you can, that's where fiscal policy enters. You can direct, you can redirect technical change through tax policy, but also through direct subsidies. And in fact, we, in, in a separate paper with Asimo Glue and other co author we, we show that there is need for both research subsidies and carbon tax because you have both a knowledge externality and you, the past dependence, but you have also a, a, a direct environmental externality. Because you have two externalities, you need at least two instruments. And so you don't, carbon tax is not enough. You need carbon tax and those subsidies. But you see, that's another case of vertical. You say you are doing dirty activities, I will redirect innovation towards clean activities through a mixture of carbon tax and, and direct subsidies to clean innovation. So that's another case for vertical, I think, for vertical activity. Alors, so that's, uh, bon, I don't want to go into tables because already it's almost five o'clock. So you see, so we, we, we have data, uh, automotive industries, 12,000 patents in clean, 36,000 patents in dirty. We have 7,000 patent holders between 78 and 2007. And the main table here, if you, uh, uh, the main table here, the, the left hand side is the propensity to innovate clean. Uh, uh, and uh, it's positively correlated with the stock of clean, it's negatively correlated with the stock of dirty, and it's positively correlated with the fuel price or the ta carbon tax. And, uh, and the more dirty you are, the more positive the effect of the carbon tax. So, the, the, so you, you, you see very clearly there, that's an example of a vertical policy, which, is, which achieves a you know, very concrete purpose. So that's what I wanted to say about the vertical targeting and the governance of, of, of industrial policy. So now I would like just to say a few words, because it's already 5 o'clock, uh, about the state as an insurer. And uh, 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 so there are various risks now that emerge, uh, 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 new risks that exist that did not exist during the 30 years post World War II. Uh, one is the labor market. You have pretty destruction. So uh, you need to deal with the workers that are displaced from job to job. Another one is the environment. Another one is the macroeconomic fluctuation. Uh, that you should deal with them differently. You cannot use a Keynesian policy. So let me, uh, let me talk about the macroeconomic regulation. And then I, I will conclude the, the talk. So uh, 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 there is a, you know, you are in the middle of a crisis. What do you do? So you have Krugman who tells you, but just stimulus, OK? Just spend everywhere, uh, partly Larry Summers you know, increase anywhere, and the people will spend the wage, and when there is a multiplier, and blah, 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 and you get out. It's not totally wrong, yeah? Uh, uh, then you have the neoconservatives say, just do tax and spending cuts to make firms very happy, and then they will, then you'll have trickle down, and then they will hire, and then uh, that's the other view, okay? So there is a third way between the two, and uh, that, uh, the view is the following. The view is that you, you it's again the mixture between, uh, <coughs> it's at the basis of it is the interplay again between credit constraints and knowledge externalities. 
you want firms to, inno to do our, maintain R&D over time because of the knowledge externality. But firms face credit constraint. And when firms face credit constraint, the problem when they have a recession is that typically they cut on R&D. That's what happened. When firms are credit constrained in a recession, because they cannot borrow up to the net present value of their profit due to the credit constraint, they can borrow a multiple of their cash flow. But when you are in a recession, yeah, you cannot borrow much. You have to pay the wage, you have to do. So you cut typically on R&D. And in fact, that's a fact. I've, I've done my studies myself. I'm sure you have. I've done that on French data. The more credit constraint firms are, the more pro-cyclical R&D is. The more you, know, you reduce R&D in recession and increase it in expansion. But R&D is something to be efficient that you need to maintain over time. So, when the, so the view there is to say when you are in an environment with high credit constraints, to counter, you, know, to, uh, you, you need the state to do what the credit market cannot do. The state could be there to have, you know, you have the notion of automatic stabilizer. We know we apply, we, we use this notion for, you know, social transfers, where you should extend it to R&D subsidies and to spend, it, you know, pro R&D things. And so the prediction is to say the more credit constrained you are, uh, the environment is, the more growth enhancing it is to have a counter cyclical fiscal policy. So it's neither Keynesian, because I look at the supply side and I look at growth, I don't just look at the short term demand effect. And I'm not uh, neoconservative because I believe that there is a role for the state because of this interplay between growth externality or knowledge externality and credit constraint. Uh, uh, so, for example, I did a study uh, which is uh, coming out in uh, GME. We have 17 OECD countries, 45 manufacturing industries, and what we show is counter cyclical fiscal policy enhances growth more in sectors that are more dependent on external finance or in sectors with lower asset tangibility. And uh, so, for example, you could look here uh, uh, the degree of counter cyclical fiscal policy. Counter cyclical fiscal policy is the extent to which you <coughs> increase deficits in recession and reduce it in booms. Okay, that's what I call a counter-cyclical country. And what's very interesting is that the most counter-cyclical country are the, uh, you know, are Denmark, uh, 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 the, the ones who are pro-cyclical are Greece and Italy. Those are pro-cyclical. And there are political economy reasons why they are pro-cyclical. And, and uh, Tabellini and Alessina have talked about them. And, uh, but that's very interesting that you know you have a big variance in the degree of pro or counter-cyclicality counter of uh, fiscal policy across OECD countries. Okay? Typically countries that have also, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, so you can look, and uh, by the way, you can see that countries that have more budget balance overall, it's easier for them to be counter-cyclical. Because if you have if you have bigger budget, uh, budget discipline, that's something that the minister, the finance minister of Sweden, Anders Borg, has very well explained. When you have better budgetary discipline, it's much easier for you to borrow in bad times because you're more credible that you will reimburse in good times. And therefore, you can borrow at much better terms. And therefore, you can be much more counter cyclical. Okay, so there are various aspects uh, you know, that make you, but that's another issue there. But what's interesting is that you can now regress growth or R&D, I could regress the same way, on the interplay between the extent to which your sector is, uh, is credit constrained and the degree of counter cyclicality. And what you can show is that the more credit constrained your sector is, the much more growth enhancing it is to have a uh, uh, counter cyclical fiscal policy. So that's a very important thing. Why is it important for Europe? Because you know that in Europe there is a debate on the budget uh, criteria. The, they ask countries to be below 3% of uh, budget deficit, uh, the benefit is 3% of GDP by 2013. But you know, it's very interesting because the fiscal compact, which defines the long term uh, 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 objective in terms of budget balance, is in structural terms. Whereas they didn't do the interim criteria in structural terms. You see what I mean? In other words, if we may leave this analysis, we should, have, we should always correct the deficit objectives for European countries for the cycle. For example, 2013 will be a terrible year in terms of growth. Terrible. You should therefore correct. The, uh, but of course, you should make that depend uh, contingent on countries doing the reforms. So what I advise Hollande to do is to say you should do structural reforms. You should you should really uh, uh, you know reduce spending. Uh, you know you have areas in the state where you spend too much and show that you are doing the right reforms. But in exchange for that, you can ask Merkel and Olli Rehn. Olli Rehn is the head of ECFIN. But now, in fact, we know that Brussels now is an annex. Everything is done in Berlin now. So now you go to Berlin, and Berlin calls Brussels. I'm a bad joke. I'm a but uh, 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 so, uh, so, that's, uh, uh, so you ask Mrs. Merkel, say, look, in exchange 
for my doing the structural reforms, uh, grant me, you make the uh, deficit objective contingent on the cycle. And this analysis suggests that that would be the right way to do, the right thing to do. You see what I mean? And that's what's missing in, in, in the macroeconomic policy in Europe. It's not sufficiently counter-cyclical. You see what I mean? You tend to punish countries just because they face the crisis, instead of helping them during the recession. But of course, contingent on them doing the right things. You see what I mean? Like Monty. Monty did a lot of reforms. He needed some help, but he didn't receive any. Of course, he, now he's finished. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the thing. So, so you see, it's interesting, the macroeconomy, because it's neither demand side, short term demand side like Keynesian, it's neither pure laissez faire, it's a, it's a state intervention, but which is a state intervention supply side growth driven, and that tells you you have to have policies that are conducive to firms maintaining RD and other type of growth enhancing investment over the, over the cycle. Uh, uh, the, there is a state as redistributor, but I, want, I want just want to say something about tax policy. I said you are the smart state. And now you said, well, you know, there are two ways. You, you need taxes, or you have the whole debate in the U.S. on tax. But you say, of, of course, one way is to say I don't, I spend smartly. That means on, on, I have criteria for horizontal and vertical targeting and governance. But you also need tax. So what is a good tax system? And I believe that the Swedish system is a good tax system. They used to have a system like France is today, which is terrible. Well, Ingmar Bergman wanted to leave, the head of IKEA wanted to leave, the Pardieu. You see the De Pardieu story, you had it in Sweden in the early 90s, okay? And they, did, they found a system which is a good compromise. It's reasonably fair, they have reasonably progressive labor tax. They, have, they tax capital income at 30% flat, uh, so it's not excessive, but it's reasonable. And, uh, uh, and they reduce the highest marginal tax rate. They used to have marginal tax rate above 80%. And now the highest is 55. So we have marginal tax rate. And when they did that, patenting went up. Went up. If you just look at patenting, innovation, growth, it was fantastic. And what was amazing is that the, the, the tax returns went up, even though taxes represented a lower share of GDP in terms of the amount of wealth that, that, that they earned was higher. Because in fact, what do you ask from a tax system? It has to be, I think, reasonably fair, because otherwise you have a divided society. That's my notion of inclusive growth. It has to have a good return, because you need to finance investment. And it has to be uh, to, to not to discourage innovation and incentives and growth. And I think, I think the Swedes, the Scandinavians, you know, but it, it resembles pretty much other in Northern Europe, managed to find a tax system. That, that's what I try to push in France. I try to say, you know, you could have a tax system like this, simple, uh, uh, reasonably fair, and also which, uh, uh, with a good return, because you need to finance investment, that allowed Sweden, of course, to keep financing higher education, health, and, and all that. They need tax returns. But they did that in a way that was consistent with growth and innovation incentives. And so that's a whole debate on how you design a tax system. And that's what I try to push in France. Of unfortunately, the people who advise, I don't want to mention names uh, of people I criticize, but the people who advise France on tax reform, they, are, they live in a world where growth is exogenous. They live in a world where there is no innovation. And they give terrible advice to the government in terms of tax policy. One of them is uh, Clark Medal. I can't believe it. Yeah. No names. <laughs> but you know who he is. OK. So, uh, 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 so, so of course, why do you want inclusive growth? Because you see, I think you need effort. You did, we, to reform the state, you need effort and sacrifice. People want to feel that it's shared. So I think that's important. You, you also want to avoid exclusion from the bottom, which leads to violence. But you also want to avoid exclusion from the top, which deters public good provision. You go to Mexico, for example. I don't know if you mean to Mexico. Mexico, the rich families, they have their own bodyguards. They have their own schools. They have their chauffeurs. They live a completely separate life. They don't contribute to the public good. That, I think, is very bad, because mobility is hampered by that. And we believe in mobility because we believe in competition. So we think that a society that excludes from the bottom and the top that's not a good idea. You see, I mean, that's why when you think of sustainable growth, you also have to think of the, uh, you know, making sure that inequality will not lead to exclusion and to the division of society. And uh, 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 bad redistribution must be done in a way that it encourages risk taking and mobility. And that's, that's, the, that's the whole uh, challenge. In fact, you see, I think that European countries are confronted to this challenge. If you wanted to summarize, you would like, you know, if you are a leader in Europe, you want to have, you need budgetary discipline, 
but you need to have not at the expense of growth, and you want inclusiveness. And if you look at this triangle, each element of the triangle is important to the other two sides. Because if you don't have growth, it will be very hard to maintain budgetary discipline in the long run. You see? That's why the Gre Germany didn't understand about Greece when they, when they charged them very high uh, interest rates. They didn't understand they were just uh, killing them and they could not have budgetary discipline in the long run. You need budgetary discipline because I explained before, when you have budgetary discipline, it's much easier to have a counter-cyclical policy and therefore to have growth. Okay? But you need exclusiveness because without inclusiveness, people don't contribute to the public good. You don't get the mobility that induces growth. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the effort for budgetary discipline is also much harder to elicit. And that's really, I think, the kind of magic triangle to, 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 be, to be achieved, uh, uh, which I believe that the Scandinavians have very well achieved. You have budgetary discipline, you have growth, and you have inclusiveness. They tell you the way to go. And I think when we say Europe is in, is, is no, in part of Europe is doing very well, actually. They got it right. And uh, other countries should just try to emulate them, to see how, well, how they did. Now, the Eurozone, to finish up, because I'm uh, really late, say, no, now you've seen all this, what would you recommend? I would recommend a growth pact. But the growth pact would be what? We'd be to say, look, we do the structural reforms. We have to, you know, cut, you know, the state. There are many spendings that are old-fashioned that have to be redone. So we do the reform of the state. We do the reform of retirement. We do the reform of the administrative layers that are useless. We do the reform, you know, we reform like the Swedes have done in the 90s. But in exchange, you should, <coughs> at the European level, you know, make sure, for example, Germany should allow more, inf you know, more inflation. You, they should let their wage go up a bit so that you will give some breathing space to the others. They, would, they should have more counter-cyclical macro policies because we should have a deficit objective contingent on the business cycle. That would give breathing space. So you see what I mean? So my feeling is to say, well, how you push structural reforms? Structural, you need the structural reform of the state and uh, product and labor market. You have what we call the structural fund in Europe. They are not used for structural reforms. They are used for projects. I think part of them could be used to, uh, 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 to, to push for structural reforms. Someone wants to do a structural reform you know, to help portability of retirement rights, to, to help portability of education diploma, well, anything that improves mobility and whatever, I, structural reforms could help. Then you have the industrial policy. We know that you, know, so you have some good criteria to look at how to do industrial policy. You should go back to the EIB, the European Investment Analysis. Do they have the right portfolio? Do they really invest in the, in the growth enhancing projects? Do they really go where you have more growth intensity and go back? And uh, the, the people talk about the project bonds, but the project bonds should be done in a way which is pro-competition and, and satisfies a bit this kind of criteria that we've looked at. So you should put on the table again, say we should do smartly uh, sectoral policy and EIB should be, you know, we should re revise the EIB policy uh, supplemented by project bond and there are things to be done there. And, and the third thing is that what I said, inflation targets should not be too tight, particularly in Northern Europe, and need to use structural measures uh, of debt and deficit to, to adjust them for the cycle. So I think there are the three parts, the structural funds for the structural reforms. You have the, the renew, the new industrial policy, which is pro-competition, which is done differently. And you have uh, uh, you know, an accompanying macro policy, of course, in exchange for the structural reforms that countries would do. And that, I think, are the components of a, of a growth pact in Europe. You see what I mean? That, that's what I wanted to. Uh, I think I should stop there for, uh, be, and uh, take some questions. Thank you.